speaker is uh, uh, Robert Temple. Uh, Bob is Deputy uh, Center Director for Clinical Science of FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research and also Acting Deputy Director of the Office of Drug Evaluation. Uh, he received his medical degree from New York University School of Medicine and in uh, 1972 joined the CDER as a review medical officer in the Division of Metabolic and Endocrine Drug Products. In his current position, he oversees the ODE-1, which is responsible for the regulation of cardiorenal, neuropharmacologic, and psychopharmacologic drug products. He's had a long-standing interest in the design and conduct of clinical trials and has written extensively on this subject. He also has a long-standing interest in hepatotoxicity of drugs, uh, having uh, participated in the first detailed FDA and NIH outside discussion of the subject back in 1978. His topic this afternoon, of course, is directly related to our discussions over the last two days. Can RCTs become easier and more efficient? Uh, Bob? Okay, so this is really going to be completely different. I'm not going to be talking mostly about epidemiologic versus control trials. Um, I want to talk mostly about what we can do to make them more efficient. And I'm mostly going to talk about one thing that um, sort of obsesses me, which is um, how to use enrichment to make better trials so they can be smaller and be more likely to show what you want them to show. Um, but as a, as a general matter, uh, there's tremendous interest in whether uh, trials can be made less expensive by collecting fewer data uh, or by making use of data that's already collected and existing in some system. Um, it, targeted monitoring's on the wrong line there, but we're uh, actively thinking about whether we could reduce the amount of monitoring, which is very, very costly and probably isn't very good at finding out what we wanted to find out. Um, there's a lot of interest in whether trials could be uh, not delayed by silly things, uh, like long delays in approval by IRBs, whether recruitment could be made more successful if it used appropriate techniques to uh, do it or worked with patient groups. Sometimes they can be very effective. Um, could we make trials larger and get the needed endpoints faster? And then I'm going to talk about enrichment strategies and uh, uh, can we adapt trials in various ways to uh, uh, help them give larger effects. Um, there's a tension between uh, the desire to have broader populations and have more generalizable information, uh, maybe lead to easier recruitment, uh, but um, maybe if the effect is smaller in the overall population than it would be in a better selected group, maybe that makes it somewhat less efficient. Anyway, I'm going to talk about, whoops, no, that wasn't right. I'm sorry, left one? There you go. Okay. So broadly, enrichment is the prospective use of any patient characteristic, demographic, pathophysiologic, historical, whatever, to select patients uh, to get a study population in which detection of a drug effect is more likely. Uh, obviously, it allows the study to be smaller if the effect is larger uh, and you'll still have adequate power. Um, this happens in every trial. You, you, you're very careful to uh, uh, try to get patients who actually have the disease. Um, uh, you try to uh, find a population that has a lot of uh, uh, outcome events, uh, high-risk patients, uh, that's called prognostic enrichment. And um, increasingly nowadays, as we understand better how populations differ in their response, we try to find the people who are likely to respond, that's uh, predictive enrichment. Um, so. It's worth acknowledging at the outset that these designs, uh, when they're done explicitly, sometimes make people nervous and cause them to wonder about uh, generalizability. Uh, my view, as someone who has to uh, think about whether a drug should be approved, is that it really helps to know it works in somebody. That's, that's a big head start, and then we can worry about the rest of it later. But one possibility is these designs should be used early 
to show an unequivocal drug effect and then look into the other populations who might not have been included. Um, but of course, increasingly, we're recognizing that all drug effects may very well be confined to subsets. We just never know about it if we study the whole population. So anyway, there's a lot going on. So the first kind of enrichment that's virtually always used is uh, practical. That is, it's mostly trying to decrease noise. So you define the entry criteria carefully. If you put people who don't have the disease, uh, that's a waste. Uh, they can't contribute. Um, one thing that uh, people try to do is find who the likely compliers are. They have various ways of doing that. One of my favorites was the old VA hypertension studies, um, which put ribo had a placebo period of a few months and put riboflavin into it. Riboflavin in the urine uh, glows when you shine uh, a, a, what was then called a woods light. I believe that's just a fluorescent light. Uh, on it, and you didn't get randomized if your urine didn't glow. So those were the first successful uh, hypertension outcome studies. The physician's health study um, gave everybody a placebo and then wrote to ask you if you'd taken it. And if you said no, uh, they didn't put you in the trial. So of course you could lie. I lied. But I always took my medicine uh, afterward. So it, it did have an effect on me. Um, you can try to eliminate placebo responders uh, in the lead-in period. They're called placebo responders. They're really people whose disease goes away for any one of a number of reasons. Uh, that's commonly done. And you can try to eliminate people who can't do a consistent treadmill, whose blood pressure rises and falls too much during the, pre, uh, the period, all reducing noise. These are all very common. Uh, but apart from that, um, there are two very important strategies that have been used. One is choosing high-risk people. People are likely to have the event of interest or likely to have a large change in the endpoint being measured during the study. Uh, that is a considerable worsening. That's uh, prognostic implications. Obviously, it has sample size and study size implications, but it has therapeutic implications, too. A 50% change in event rate means more in a high-risk population that had a lot of events than in a low-risk population and could lead to a different view of a particular toxicity. Uh, the third kind of enrichment is choosing people more likely to respond, predictive enrichment, and there's a huge range of these things that are coming along, some of them related to pathophysiology, proteomic, proteomic or genomic characteristics, but they could also be empiric based on a patient's history of responding to similar drugs or even uh, using what's called a randomized withdrawal design where you, where you give everybody the drug, take the responders, and then take the drug away in a random way. If the population that responds is relatively small, 20% or something, and you don't know who responds and who doesn't, that can be a very efficient way to do a trial. Um, <clears throat> so how do we go about selecting high-risk patients? This is done all the time. Uh, we use epidemiologic risk factors. Uh, severity of heart failure very effectively predicts whether you're going to die. Uh, having had a recent event, heart attack or stroke, predicts whether you're likely to have another one of those. History of angina, TIA, elevated cholesterol, elevated blood pressure. All of those things are used all the time. I'll show a little bit from the Jupiter study of resuvastatin, which took people with relatively low cholesterols but who also had a high C-reactive protein and got enough events to show something. Uh, there can be individual measurements that, uh, that uh, uh, predict, and I'll show some uh, examples later of what some people think anyway are ways to detect people who are gonna have a high recurrence rate in oncology, the ideal population to put into an adjuvant study. <coughs> um, so in one way or another, it's pretty routine to find people at high risk so that the intervention will have events to uh, prevent. Uh, this has been done in breast cancer prevention, looking at people in high risk, or it could be. Uh, outcome studies of lipid-lowering agents have been put done in people with a history of heart attack, very high cholesterol, and so on. Um, and studies of antiplatelet therapies are done in angioplastic patients, at least partly because angioplastic patients have a lot of MIs following the angioplasty. Um, there's a lot of interesting uh, potential for pharmacologically or proteomically identifying high-risk patients, for example, with Alzheimer's disease and various cancers. Um, and I'll give some examples. 
so uh, one, one from a long time ago is tamoxifen had been shown to prevent contralateral breast uh, tumors in the adjuvant setting. Obviously, those are high-risk people for getting another tumor. But there was a desire to study in people who hadn't had a breast cancer yet. So it was studied in people with more general high risk as defined by something called the Gale model, and that was done to have enough endpoints to detect a possible effect, and because the drug was not benign. So it was, label, it was shown in a trial like that, and then was labeled for the group studied, and you, you got given a Gale model to figure out with a, a calculator, Gale model calculator, to decide whether your risk was large enough to justify using the drug. This, again, to emphasize this, this wasn't because we thought the effect was larger in that population. It was these were the people who were at risk for having an event. Um, <coughs> these are data from, uh, from uh, D'Amico. Uh, I should tell you, not everybody appears to believe this, but it illustrates the potential. Uh, he looked at uh, something like 1,000 patients with uh, 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 a pr a prostate, prostatic cancer and group people by their, what's called PSA velocity. Uh, a high velocity is that you went up two nanograms per ml per year in the year before treatment. This shows recurrence rate, and it shows that for the low velocity, the recurrence rates were all pretty much the same. Um, but if you had a, a high velocity, it was much larger. But more important than that was the mortality. In, in this population, you can see mostly has a lot of data up through five years. Basically, nobody with low velocity died, and quite a number of people with high velocity died. So if you're doing a prostate, uh, you know, an adjuvant therapy tumor or treating localized prostate uh, with, with, uh, with something, and you want to have a survival effect, which is very important in prostate cancer, it's pretty obvious who you should put in the trial. Again, this probably has to be validated by people, but the concept is there. <coughs> um, a few years ago, Fan uh, looked at a whole bunch of gene expression profiles in people with uh, uh, breast cancer who, who had just had their local cancer taken out. Um, and what he looked at was the likelihood that they would recur and, again, that they would uh, die. Uh, four of the five methods, and I'm not going to go through all of them, had high concordance and a striking ability to predict uh, the outcome, and the difference was very large. I'm just going to show one of them. This was a uh, 70 gene profile, you can see people with the good prognosis are up on the top, so their recurrence rate is very low, and their mortality rate is very low, but the people with the bad outcome had much more uh, likelihood of recurrence and much more likelihood of dying. So if you're doing an adjuvant trial, you really want to take the bottom ones now. That assumes they're going to respond as well, which we don't know, but if you want enough events to do, you can reduce the number of events drastically by choosing that. <coughs> in cardiovascular area, it's long been routine to choose for outcome studies patients at high risk uh, in secondary prevention, post-infarction trials or stroke, very high cholesterol, and so on. And it makes an unbelievable difference in the size of the study. The consensus study, the first study done of enalapril and the first study to show that an ACE inhibitor could improve survival, uh, New York Heart Association class four patients were the only ones studied. A study of only 253 patients were able to show a dramatic survival effect in only six months. I mean, that's incredible. All the subsequent studies had many thousands of people in them. And the reason was that mortality untreated was 40% in just two months. There were plenty of events to, uh, uh, to prevent. Uh, the first lipid outcome trial that was successful, the forest study of simvastatin, was in a post-infarction, very high cholesterol population with a 9% five-year cardiovascular mortality, and 4,444 patients were able to show a substantial mortality effect. The later studies really mostly couldn't show a mortality effect or needed much larger trials, and they used composite endpoints and things like that. So the fact that there were a lot of events really helped a lot, and I won't dwell on the Jupiter study, but these were in people whose uh, cholesterol was less than 130, which is not even, uh, you wouldn't ordinarily even treat a person like that, but they had high C-reactive protein, and by picking that population in a pretty large, but 18,000 patient study, uh, they were able to show a clear, clear effect on survival and many other endpoints, but I, I don't think we have time. Um, there's lots of other things that people are thinking about, uh, apart from the cardiovascular set, uh, uh, setting, 
there's huge interest in seeing if one could reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. There's certainly no hint that we know how to do it yet. Um, but to have any chance of doing so, you've got to find a population that's going to get it. Well, how are you going to do that? There, uh, there are a number of possibilities. One, you can get people who are sort of started on the way, but a lot of people would think that might be too late. So there's going to be interest in genomic uh, characterizations and so on. Um, certainly, what has to be the most exciting thing going on now, uh, particularly in oncology, but starting to leak into other places, is uh, predictive enrichment, finding people with the greatest likelihood of responding to a particular kind of treatment. Um, obviously, what that does to the power of the study is uh, staggering. Um, this is especially important when the responders are only a small fraction of all the people with a condition, which could be in a lot of situations. There's lots of drugs that don't treat everybody, that only treat a minority, uh, but we usually don't know who they treat. Um, uh, Rich Simon has, and, and has uh, worked this out. If, for example, the, uh, the marker positive patients are only 25% of the group and the response in the marker negative patients is zero, which sort of happens in some oncology settings, the sample size difference is a factor of 16. Uh, that's a very big deal. Um, and we've made use of things like that. We recently approved uh, Ivacaftor for uh, cystic fibrosis patients who had a specific gene mutation that is only present in 4% of CF populations. If you'd done an unselected patient population with that drug, you would have seen nothing. Uh, as it was, it was very easy to show an effect. Um, and I think I'll skip that one. Um, even if the pathophysiology is unclear, sometimes uh, likely responders can be identified by initial short-term response, which I would generally call an empiric strategy. Uh, that's very helpful when the response rate is low, and people have tried these things. One of my favorites, of course, can't say it worked out very well, was uh, the CAS study, which was carried out only in people who showed a 70% reduction of VPBs in, in a pretreatment pre period. Only the responders were randomized. Of course, it doubled their mortality, but still, it was really a great plan. Um, beta blocker heart attack trials were all screened for their ability to tolerate the beta blocker in a pre-randomization period. <coughs> and there are really uh, uh, many examples of that. I should say every randomized withdrawal study has that characteristic. If you do a, a maintenance study in people with depression, you only pick people who've responded, and it greatly increases the ability of those studies to show anything. There are many other things one could do. You could study only patients who make the active metabolite of clopidogrel. That would increase your uh, chance of doing something. You could only study patients whose tumor shows an early metabolic effect in a PET scan or early response on some blood measure. Uh, you could only study patients whose tumors take up the drug. That's how I-131 was used over the years, uh, going way back. You could look at uh, only patients whose tumor doesn't grow over a n-week period. It'd be hard to randomize patients who did respond. That's been suggested by Rich Simon also. Um, one thing nobody's ever done is you could only study in your outcome study people whose LDL study was very large. It would greatly reduce the size of the study. I don't know that anybody's ever done that, but it could be done for the first study if you didn't really know the drug worked. Um, anyway, we're really at the very beginning of, uh, of uh, doing, doing these things. Um, I think I've already said all that. Uh, one, one interesting example of, of, uh, of either a proteomic or whatever you want to say comes from a long time ago. There's, further data since then on genetic characteristics, but this is uh, uh, Tarceva uh, as used in uh, uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Um, this wasn't planned. This was done after the study was done, but because the study won, we paid attention to it. So the, 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 uh, uh, the study had about 700, uh, 730 people in it, and the survival in months was 6.7 on the drug versus 4.7 overall. It was nominally significant at 0.01. That was interesting. They also happened, and, and that's the kaplan meier curve. They also happened to have uh, data on about a third of these people on EGFR status of the tumor. EGFR is how Tarceva works. It's what it attaches to and uh, turns off the tyrosine kinase connected to it. 
So if you look at those populations, it's really quite small numbers, you see, what you see uh, is that survival was in the, in the EGFR positive group was almost 11 months versus uh, 3.8 months on placebo, a huge effect, nominally significant. If you were negative for this receptor, which would mean the drug isn't likely to work, um, you had no effect at all. Now, there was some suspicion of whether that was a good measure, blah, 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 and it was taken out of the labeling for a while, but it's back in because we now have a genetic uh, version of the same thing. But the possibility is, uh, is really impressive. And that's what the Kaplan-Meier curves look like for the two. <coughs> um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of new examples, and I think I won't go through all of these, but uh, imatinib, an unresectable and metastatic uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, um, uh, a tyrosine kinase activating mutation, uh, uh, showed a response rate of 55 out of 56 patients who had durable responses if they were positive, uh, much different in, in negative. There was good results in an adjuvant trial. These are effect sizes in oncology that are in many ways unprecedented, and I won't go through all of them. Um, there were dramatic hepatitis C effects in patients with type 1 virus, which had been the most resistant and showed a response to bosepravir and telaprevir with better duration and many cures, not curves and shorter treatment than in the past uh, compared to interferon plus ribavirin. Um, as I said, we have this new, uh, new drug for cystic fibrosis, which shows dramatic improvement, although in only in 4% of the population. Um, okay, so that, that's, that's my enrichment uh, thing. I just wanted to mention a couple of other possibilities that are worth thinking about in special situations. One is uh, crossover designs. We don't use crossover designs much, and I think it's partly our fault. I think we've discouraged them. We're nervous about carryover effects and dropouts and stuff like that. But it cuts the sample in half and reduces uh, intrapatient uh, interpatient variability, so it's probably worth thinking about. And um, I just love this old study from 1976. This was a study of Danazol in hereditary angioedema. It included nine patients, nine patients. They all had to have at least one attack per month, and they were assigned to random sequence of either drug or placebo, each taken for a month, but as soon as you had an attack, you moved on to the next one. There were a total of uh, 46 or 47 courses. One out of 46 Danazol courses had an attack. 44 out of 47 placebo courses had an attack. That's pretty good, huh? Um, and there may be other possibilities where you can do that, where the drug really works. Um, so other things that are on our minds that we're thinking about, uh, it's very hard to say we've made any progress. Um, it seems very worthwhile to increase the use of central ARBs, which are permitted but are hardly ever used. It could save a lot of time in getting a protocol going. The possibility that there could be a standard uh, protocol that would be used in certain therapeutic areas that IRBs would all be familiar with and funding agencies would all be familiar with. Uh, that seems worth thinking about, uh, too. The iSpy program has elements of that. Um, everybody is thinking about using healthcare system databases, first to invite patients to participate, um, using clear, patient-friendly dis descriptions of the trial. I think uh, healthcare environments ought to be explaining to patients why it's so good for everybody to be in clinical trials, and it would teach them what's the most effective and most efficient uh, maybe that could uh, work. Certainly, certain organizations like the Cystic Fibrosis Group out west has convinced its members that joining trials is the best thing to do, and we're seeing more and more of that. Where the endpoints are well collected within the system, always debatable, of course, uh, in HMOs and the VA, consider trials using existing data as endpoints. Uh, that has enormous promise and could save fortunes if it can be successful. Um, we believe that there's uh, excessive data collection in, in many trials. We have a guidance that we, that whose formal title is Determining the Extent of Safety Data Collection Needed in Late Stage Premarket and Post Approval Clinical Investigations. But if you don't like that, you can call it AE Light. Um, it suggests decreased collection of non important data, minor adverse effects, excess lab data, things like that. We're not seeing a whole lot of take up of this, but in many long-term outcome studies, uh, certainly less data are collected. And then a significant cost of trial is on-site monitoring, and 
how useful that is at really detecting the things you wanted to detect is at least debatable. And we've issued guidance um, in addition to the ICHE6 document, which sort of suggests some flexibility here. Uh, but that it suggests that a risk-based risk -based approach with more central monitoring could be as or more effective with substantially reduced cost. I don't think we've seen huge take up of that either, but it's, uh, it's promising. In the rare cases where we've thought we detected really bad behavior at individual sites, it was usually looking at the whole data that was informative, not looking at the data on site. So, thanks. <laughs>